Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Clint Eastwood and guest moderator David Schwartz. How many people just came in here to look at like the iPod Touch and now you're here to see Clint Eastwood? That's pretty good, right? So uh, Mr. Eastwood is in town. He's getting the uh, Best Actor of the Year Award for the National Board of Review um, tonight. And um, this is the number one movie in the country. It's also the top grossing film that you've directed, top opening weekend. And you've now made 29 films as a director. You've actually directed more films than even Martin Scorsese. <laughs> so you're, it's a great success for you, this movie, so far. Okay, that's it. Um, and, um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, I, I don't uh, know about all those uh, st statistics, but, right. I, but you're telling me, and I, I believe you, because you have an honest face. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and it's a pleasure being here in New York. Beautiful sunny day. A little on the zippy side, but uh, that's okay. You're, yeah. You came, uh, came from 80 degree weather to be here. No, this is good though. This okay. is nice. This is a little uh, more refreshing in the morning. <laughs> Except I lost the uh, cord to my razor, so I, I couldn't shave. So I'm well, you look, you look looking kind of like a teenage guy. <laughs> you know, hip. Uh, this is such a satisfying movie to see. It's such it uh, has so many great virtues, uh, both from the filmmaking standpoint. Of course, your performance. You've now created a brand new character of Walt Kowalski, who will just go down as one of the great. Um, characters you've given us as an actor, but it's also a great piece of filmmaking. Um, could you talk about how, I, uh, first of all, just how you came to this project? Because it's um, by a first time, this is a, a film by a first time screenwriter, is that true? Uh, yeah, uh, Nick Shanga, somebody uh, uh, tried to get it to my agent and it didn't get there, and then finally uh, 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 Bill Gerber uh, sent it to over to my uh, associate and he read it. He said, I think this is kind of an interesting story, but you might not want to do it because the guy's kind of a racist and, <laughs> and uh, kind of, and he's kind of a wild guy who, but uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. And I said, it sounds good to me. I said, I don't, not that I uh, want to particularly play all those things, but uh, I just thought it's a, it sounded like a fun, uh, uh, sound like a, a, you could take him on a little journey and yeah. and start him on one side of life and then move him to the other and uh, and it, it it was a, a message of the story was great because it's uh, uh, shows that there's you're never too old to uh, learn and uh, whether it's tolerance or anything else for that matter and I've always been a big advocate of that that's kind of why I'm still working at 78 years of age because I uh, <laughs> I I like. Uh, I like learning something new all the time. And every time you do a project, you always f learn new things, and uh, that, that makes it fun. And then also, uh, uh, the Hmong culture was kind of new to me, and that was, uh, I thought that was fun to yeah. deal with that. So just to set it up a little bit, in case you haven't seen the film, Walt Kowalski is um, a Korean War veteran. He's living in Michigan, um, in his about the same age that you say you are. Um, and I just lost his wife, and um, he's a crank, to say the least, bigoted. Um, so he, he, he's constantly making sort of bigoted comments about the neighbors, the Hmongs, um, Asians, African-Americans, whoever's in, in the neighborhood. So um, He's an e equal opportunity insulter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what drew you to the character? You've, you, um, as I said, you've been directing a lot of films. This is your first uh, big performance since um, Million Dollar Baby as an actor. So what is it about Walt that appealed to you to well, play? This place, uh, this way, I didn't have to worry about dialogue. All I had to do is just sit there and go. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, he just sort of growls all the right, time. Right. So And you could just fill in with a few lines here and there. <laughs> but uh, I, I just like, uh, you know, it's very difficult. There's not a lot of great roles for guys at, uh, at, at this age, but... Uh, I was in the uh, military during the Korean War, though I didn't go to Korea. Uh, and I knew a lot of guys like this. I grew up with a lot of guys in the 30s and 40s that were like him. And uh, either they were uncles or uh, fathers or grandfathers of, people, of kids that I knew. And uh, so, I, you know, th this guy just seemed like uh, he, he was, 
he was a real person that I had yeah. seen in my mind somewhere. Um, and the script does not hold back. I mean, this, you know, I'm saying he's bigoted. It just goes all out. It, it, it doesn't uh, mind the fact that some people might be upset, to, you know, at first to hear some of these. You know, you can't uh, do that. I think one of the things, I think everybody in, in uh, I think uh, people in general are tired of walking on eggs anyway. And that's what we've been doing the last few decades is wandering around uh, uh, on eggshells because uh, everybody is so worried about uh, being sensitive. And uh, this way, you, you know, you can just you can just sit there and vicariously live through a guy who's totally insensitive, and uh, it's uh, so it's uh, it, it's fun. I think everybody'd like to be Walt Kowalski for maybe about ten minutes and then to drop <laughs> it from there. But because uh, he, he is uh, uh, honest in his feelings, but then he, you know he 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 goes somewhere. He, I mean, he changes and he changes due to the his relationship with the Hmong culture next door. And, yeah. and uh, I think his telling moment is he says, I have more in common with these people than I do my spoiled, rotten family. And it also talks about family uh, uh, and uh, f f the feeling family has towards, uh, um, uh, t towards their father and the grandfathers. They're always wanting to put them away in American style of putting everybody in assisted living and get rid yeah. of them. Uh, so the family can go on about their lives and and people wanting to get their inheritance and uh, whether it's a Grand Torino or whatever. Uh, we we have two very short scenes from the film, so just to give a flavor of it, why don't we? The first scene that we'll show um, shows you an encounter with with these neighbors. You're sitting on on the porch. Your Walt is sitting on the porch doing what he likes to do best, which is uh, drink beer all afternoon. Hey, so that's uh, that is typecasting that part. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's run the first clip. <laughs> um, seeing that clip raises a few questions about how you work as a director. One of the things I loved about the movie when I said it, it uh, feels so classical is the way that you use space in the film. Uh, like a great old Western where, where the layout of the town and the buildings and the houses um, is a f uh, you know, sets up the drama. Um, you do that here, the way the whole space is arranged in the film, um, the way this community is, is arranged. So how do you do that as a director? When you get a script, how do you start to think of sort of how the film's going to look, how it's going to unfold in space? Uh, well, it, it just depends. I think that uh, I think if, when I first started directing years ago, I was more interested in close-ups because I was an actor turning director, and actors <laughs> always love close-ups and everything. But then... As time goes on, you start realizing that space is very important, and uh, and uh, and that uh, now and and now when I watch a, a television shows and everything that are shot almost exclusively in close-ups, I kind of yeah. think, well, well, they're losing the uh, they're losing so much, you know, th out there. The, and in the old-fashioned day, days of John Ford and uh, Howard Hawks and everything, they used close-ups also, but they didn't use them co constantly. Yeah, this film just kind of breathes in a way. You yeah. feel like you're in the space. They give it to a chance to breathe, and then all yeah. of a sudden they punctuate with right. close-ups. But now people are punctuating kind of almost constantly, and they don't uh, they don't take advantage of that. And this picture, because it's uh, uh, in a small neighborhood, and it's a uh, it's only very few characters, um, they they get the uh, uh, feeling that uh, you you want the feeling that. It's got some openness to it, and you know, give yeah. it some size to it. Yeah. Now, the other thing that, I, um, that the clip raised is um, the casting in the film. I mean, because you've got these younger actors, all the, the actors, if, I believe that most of the actors who play the, the Hmong characters are relative newcomers, um, but they're such great, they're great performances, and, the, and you, you did an amazing job casting the movie. So, could you talk about that? Well, casting is very important. It's the most important uh, part of the movie, really, is just getting the right faces, the right look, and the right performers. Now, in the case of the Hmong culture, there was no actors that I knew of. There wasn't a, a large uh, array to uh, pick from. So, uh, so we just started testing new people. Yeah. And uh, these kids were uh, both 16 and 17 when we did the film, so they were very young. Uh, I think the young lady that you saw in the clip there uh, had done a maybe a high school play or a few things like that, but uh, they really were not experienced people, but they just had a look that looked real to me. And uh, so eventually uh, we got started and they just jumped right into it and got with mm. the program. Wow, okay. Well, uh, actually, let's, um, 
let's just show the other clip now because I think this, this young actor that you mentioned is all, also really remarkable. And I think he was um, a kid who was getting ready to go to med school and you know, maybe had been in drama club, but wasn't really planning on being a major movie actor. So uh, anyhow, we'll, we'll see this clip. This is the character who you befriend in the film. I never heard anything about med school. <laughs> 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 Oh, no, it's eight. Clip eight we want to go to. I like the chicken dumpling part. Why didn't we stick with that? We could do... <laughs> <laughs> you see, Walt is not really sure. I mean, he's get becoming friends with this kid, but you can tell by he's slightly wincing there, like, what am I doing? And that's right. kind of the way he is. He's a reticent man. Yeah, but he's open at the same time. I mean, he's reticent, and the insults, you know, are, is sort of a defense mechanism. But it's also a way of showing affection. Like one of the ways that you, you know, one of the great characters in the film is the barber, and you guys just insult each other, and that's how you show your friendship. Yeah, well, that's. Uh, I grew up uh, in, in a neighborhood that we did that. Everybody called each other by the names, and everybody <laughs> called each other by their uh, by their uh, ethnic. Uh, right. <laughs> of, of affiliation, and that was the way it was. And and even people, like Italian people, would call themselves by that, that names. And everybody did it, and they always did it with a smile on their face, of course. If you didn't, then it was another thing again. Right. But, uh, right. Uh, people weren't worried about that sort of thing. Everybody and the smile, you had to, like Walt had, you sort of felt the smile there underneath, but you had to not show it. You had to keep the sort of tough face. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you think about um, your past roles? I mean, the, what, you know, we've talked about you as a director and an actor, but you also are um, an, an iconic figure in a way. You know, some of the characters you've created just have an iconic place in our, in our memory. Dirty Harry is the most obvious one in relation to this film. So how do you think about the fact that, that your performance is sort of, the audience that's watching the film has your past performances in mind when they're watching the film. You must be thinking about that. Uh, no, I'm not thinking about anything, really. Right. <laughs> Just, um, well, you know, after, uh, when you've been uh, doing a certain job for 55 years, you kind of start, you know, a lot of different generations have come and gone with you. So a lot of uh, people uh, uh, made out in front of the TV set uh, to Rawhide. And, and then eventually uh, you, you go out and... Uh, and and uh, you, uh, you uh, I did the Western genre, the Italian Western genre, and then up through the detective stories of the '60s and '70s, and and uh, and so you know, uh, uh, all of a sudden, you see most uh, most people, uh, most of the folks here have either known me, and uh, uh, you know, they associate you with some point in their life. Maybe it's a uh, senior hi high school, or maybe it's uh, a. Yeah. Uh, junior high school, or maybe it's grammar school, whatever. <laughs> but uh, that's kind of the way it is. So that's where the, uh, the so-called quote yeah. unquote iconic comes from. <laughs> it has nothing else. I just outstayed my welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that you have done, and, and um, this is not exactly a question, but the the you keep growing as a director. I mean, you you don't just see, you since I sort of feel like since Bird. I don't know if you saw that film as a turning point, but the Quality I thought he was going to say, I didn't know if I saw it. Yeah. No, no, no. If you I, I have, you know, my memory is somewhat <laughs> shot, but it's not quite that it's, bad. I'd recommend it. You should, de you know, definitely check it out. Uh, but the movies since then, they're, they're, they've just gone up to this level that's unbelievable. Um, Unforgiven, Mystic River, uh, Bridges of Madison County. Uh, I, don't, I mean, the, the growth is in your films has just been amazing to watch. The evolution um, of you as a director. So anyhow, I said that's not a, it's not a question there, but it's just been. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, but well, you know, you just do different things, and uh, the one thing I always fought against, back in the '60s when I was doing the uh, dollar films with Sergio Leone, right. which were great fun, uh, by the way. But at some point, I knew I had to come back into this country and start uh, doing um, uh, films uh, locally, and I had to start doing films outside the Western genre. As much as I love the Western genre, I just figured if I had kept doing those, I'd ev eventually uh, run out of steam on, on yeah. that, and that would have been uh, the end of it. So I just kept expanding the career. 
And in 1970, I started uh, directing. I directed a film where I played a disc jockey and uh, everything. And, and I, I, against, uh, a lot of, uh, against a lot of advice from the studio, they said, nobody wants to see uh, you play a disc <laughs> jockey. And I said, I love being a disc jockey. I always wanted to be one, you know, play music and uh, have, have a good time. But um, yeah. why not? You've also got a good singing voice, which we hear in this movie. Oh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Yeah. It is. I'm not going to lose my day job, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, I'll ask one thing, then we'll open it up to the audience. But the, um, the, the movie is, captures a lot about what it is to be in America these days, what the country is going through um, on a number of levels, both sort of the economy, um, immigration. Uh, you know, it's not heavy-handed at all about this, but it is sort of a portrait of America today. It's about what it is to be an American today. So I'm just wondering how you think about that. Yeah, well, I, I definitely like the script for that one reason. And we, we're going into uh, to Michigan and uh, where he, uh, w w the story has, he worked in the Ford factory for years. And here we are talking about depressed business or uh, American economy uh, that wants to be bailed out uh, and um, is having problems. And here is a guy who's retired from it. And then the immigration factory you brought in. All those things make make this picture, I think, uh, on a, a contemporary in that in that yeah. sense, yeah. and uh, f that was one of the reasons. And uh, not to mention all the other things about family, about his relationship to religion or lack thereof, and uh, and then finally his decision, the way he decides to rescue this kid. Yeah. Uh, okay. So why don't we open it up now? It's any and um, we have microphones, so. I guess just wait till they bring the microphone over here. David, we're actually going to ask if you can uh, point and just repeat the question. Okay, I'll repeat the question. So uh, go ahead. You Okay, the question is if, um, I guess it's an actor, if there are any directors that you wish you had had a chance to work with living or dead? A, a ton of them. Uh, I, always, uh, I always admired uh, the, the two fellows I had mentioned earlier, Ford and Hawks. And uh, I did get to work with William Wellman once for a very small part in a picture, um, uh, but not in one of his great pictures uh, when in, in his heyday. Uh, but uh, Preston Sturgis, um, uh, I did work with John Sturgis uh, one time too. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, and th these were all interesting people along the way, but I didn't, uh, and I never got, I sort of missed that generation of the, uh, of the 40s where there was a lot of great directors came along. And uh, so I, I didn't, uh, I didn't g get to that. And because I started in television, uh, there was a lot of television directors coming up, but we had a lot of old time directors too that, uh, that came along and worked on Rawhide, um, Stuart Heisler and Laszlo Benedict and uh, people like that who were, who had done films and, uh, and and done a lot of films and quite well, and um, so it was a great experience, uh, learning experience. But yeah, I missed a whole generation of working with uh, people, uh, George Stevens, uh, you know. You're yeah. really doing, in a way, what Howard Hawks did. I mean, you, you have a s kind of similar style, and he also made films that were sort of about groups of people coming together and making sort of families. That's what this, the neighbors become to you, a surrogate family. Yeah, he, he, he did, and, and he also did a lot of different genres, too. He'd yeah. go, he'd do Red River on one hand, and then His Girl Friday right. on another, and two, two completely opposite styles and the opposite. Things and that that uh, is what made those guys fascinating. I think uh, uh, is that they they weren't mired down in just in just one thing. And Ford, uh, even though he was uh, very well known for the Western genre, he also did uh, some of his biggest hits were in other uh, other types of films. Yeah, I thought you were going to ask like what directors you learned the most from that you did work with. I mean, what would you? Uh, well, you know, over I, I guess I'd have to say. Uh, uh, all of them. I mean, over and and all of them. Uh, whether I worked with them or not, I just growing up watching the films. You kind of learn a lot about them and learn a lot about what their uh, uh, thoughts are. Um, but I did learn a lot from Sergio Leone because uh, I got th to go over and work. Uh, even though it was a it was an American, it was an American genre. It was uh, it was an Italian's uh, take on it. So that was great fun. And uh, then coming back and Don Siegel, of course, was a. Uh, 
a close friend of mine and a, and a mentor, and I worked on about four or five films with him. Uh, maybe more, I can't remember now. I have to flip the file. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Go ahead, up back there. With your, yeah. I was curious as to all the talents that you bring to film, directing, acting, producing, is there anyone in particular that you enjoy the most, or maybe a combination? Okay, I guess if all the different talents you bring, directing, producing, acting, or maybe all the different crafts, is there one part of filmmaking that you enjoy the most? <laughs> I, I don't know. I started out as an actor, and uh, and uh, all through the '50s and '60s, and then, uh, and the, but I think I wanted to become a director in the, and it started in 1970 with Play Misty uh, for me, and I, I wanted to become because I felt that someday I would uh, not want to be uh, an actor anymore, and uh, and so I. Uh, started working my way into that because I, I figured, you know, you got to look up on the screen someday and said, that's enough of that. <laughs> and uh, and I, I've said that many times, but I still end up doing it, so I have a masochistic streak, streak somewhere. But um, uh, I, I think I think I like directing the best, at least at this point in life. Uh, maybe uh, uh, my ego would have liked to have uh, seen my golden locks, which are no longer golden, uh, when... Uh, when uh, I was younger, who knows? I can't remember that far back. Okay, over here. Briefly, um, you have a reputation uh, in the industry as being a very uh, efficient uh, filmmaker when you your introduction, uh, more so probably than most others that you read about. Uh, you do very few takes from what I understand. Um, my question is, when you work, you gain that kind of, uh, that kind of level of, of performance from your actors, how much time do you actually Yeah, so you're, you're known as being a very efficient director, um, which is why you can make two films a year. Uh, but your work, in terms of working with act actors, how much rehearsal time do you have as part of that process? Well, that just depends on uh, sometimes none and sometimes a lot. It d depends. Um, for instance, uh, on Mystic River, the actors all wanted to rehearse and, and because they were all sort of an ensemble uh, and that uh, they had a lot of scenes together. And so they... Would sit, and they also they were worried about the accent of uh, using the Boston accent. So the actors all got together and they rehearsed uh, at night, and I encouraged that. But I didn't sit in with them. I just let them go, let them uh, let them work it all out. And uh, in other pictures, uh, in this pic particular picture where I used non-actors or new new actors, um, I just um, got them in the situation and just let them go for, and I t try to. Uh, uh, keep him relaxed and uh, feeling free about it. And once in a while, you'd go back and remind them that they have to listen more intently, or they have to uh, uh, make certain transitions, uh, uh, points. But uh, basically, just let everybody let everybody be. I don't. Uh, I find that a lot of actors that uh, uh, I'm a lot of directors that talk a lot and and go over things. A lot, are usually trying to talk themselves into the scene. They're not really doing much favor for the actor. But so I try to. Uh, it, it, it just depends. It depends on the experience of the actor. Some, some of them like to just jump right in. I like to see what they're going to bring, too. It's all, that's one of the, the fun things about directing a film, is to watch, um, uh, uh, watch and see what the actor's imagination is going to bring, because they've read the same material and working from it as, as you are. And, uh, and then when, if they're, doing, if they're on, on track, you encourage them to stay on track like that, and if they're off track, then you encourage them to get on the track that you would like. You really create a relaxed atmosphere on the set. I read that you don't say action. Is that true at the beginning? No, I find action uh, gets everybody tense. You know, they just there's a little <laughs> tiny thing there, and I learned that years ago from uh, uh, working on a on a western um, series. Uh, and the uh, the directors would uh, always want to scream action. And I remember we were out, four or five of us were all out there on horseback, and we were going to come back in. We had to ride up to the camera and then say a few lines, and that was the end of the sequence. And when the director, we'd come riding up, and the director would yell action at the top of his lungs, and the horses would go every which way. They'd, just <laughs> go, they'd scatter out, and, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, then they, the horses didn't like booms coming down and, uh, with, uh, for, for sound. And... Uh, so I, I just, finally I went to the director and I suggested, I said, why, why don't you just not say action? Why don't you just stand there and go, 
and, and we'll all see that because we're not stupid. <laughs> and, and, and we'll all just ride right up and we'll say the line. And it seemed to work, at least at that one time. And uh, so we did that, and, and I felt very proud of myself. Uh, <laughs> so that just, uh, started a style. <laughs> right down here. Okay, oh, that's it. I'd love to see you, uh, you know, what you do internationally. That's also a writing a book. Okay, good lead in. Like, okay, so any plans to write a book, first of all, and then um, making films in other countries uh, because you've done so many American other films, genres. so, or other, either other genres or other countries? Yeah, well, I, I actually, I um, sort of became uh, known as a director in, in, in Europe before here. At least I was accepted there before. Uh, before I was in this country and, uh, back in the 70s. So um, I'm s uh, sort of partial to all kinds of uh, genres and all kinds of uh, philosophies coming from different societies. Uh, but uh, to write a book, I'm not, um, I'm not sure about that. I, I really have, uh, I've never felt I had to just exp spill my guts uh, for, um, uh, of, of I, you know, I, I, I've been kind of a, uh, int introvert and at times and I just felt that it's not necessary to share everything in the world but uh, I have written a book I, d I mean I cooperated with a book with Richard Schickel wrote and uh, and that um, and uh, I don't know what else I'd say in there I, I, I'm, s I'm sure if I sat down and did it uh, I would but I, I don't have any plans for that now <laughs> huh Songs. Songs. If you want to keep directing yeah. movies, that's fine too. That'll probably work. <laughs> I like. Okay. Oh, well, I love songs. I love uh, music, and I started out as music as a kid, and I was interested in that, and then I kind of lost uh, the direction there, and then came back to it. So that's been great fun. Okay. Okay. Right down here. Okay, is there truth to the rumors that Gran Torino might be your last film as an actor? And if, n if not, are there other, other, other performances? Uh, you know, I don't know that. I think I was musing uh, in front of a British uh, journalist, and he, <laughs> I said, I know this is probably the last one. I, I think I've been saying that for years. <laughs> Every, I, when I did Million Dollar Baby, I said, oh, this is perfect. This is the last film. Uh, when, I, when I did Unforgiven in 92, I said, this, is, this will be a perfect last Western. I mean, the way the story came out and everything, and it has been so far. And then, uh, then with Million Dollar Baby, I thought, this would be a perfect last film to act in, and because um, he wanders off after uh, his surrogate daughter dies, and, and, and then he, uh, and that'll be a perfect way to go into the sunset. However, you know, you never know. You never say never, but, uh, uh, so I was musing in front of this uh, journalist, and so he put it out as the gospel, and there we are. And, and it might be. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know how many great roles, if any, uh, or any kind of roles they have for guys uh, my age. I mean, I could play butlers and stuff like that and be sort of like <laughs> be, become sort of the Clifton Webb of uh, modern-day times. So. <laughs> well, you don't look your age. Yeah. Well, <laughs> It's amazing what a belt sander will do, you know. You can <laughs> have <it> do. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go to the hardware store. We'll send you to an ophthalmologist, too. <laughs> okay, uh, back there. Are there any actors or actresses that you would like to work with that you have not worked with yet? Well, actresses. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, uh, um, yeah, a lot of them, a, a ton of them. I, I, I can't think of, uh, uh, they're too numerous to, to really uh, uh, nail down, but there's so many really wonderful uh, uh, talents coming along and, 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 and existing talents out there that are working. I'd love to, to work with them. And uh, uh, this year I got to work with uh, a lot of really great uh, uh, actors and, uh, and Angelina, who of course is easy to look at <laughs> and and she's extremely talented and uh, and then uh, in Gran Torino I got to work with uh, new people so it's always uh, evolving everything is evolving and that's the fun part of the of the the job <laughs> and we do get to see Walt flirt with some of the teenage girls in the film that's nice yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I don't know about it <laughs> okay no over comment. here <laughs> over here Don Siegel was your mentor. 
And I wonder if you're mentoring uh, anybody on your crew, and how's that? How are you paying that forward? Well, you talked about Don Siegel as a mentor, and the question is whether you feel like you're a mentor to anybody on your crew or people that you've worked with. Uh, well, I've worked with a lot of actors uh, over and over again, but I haven't. Uh, 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 but not quite as much as uh, as, as Don and I uh, uh, did. But uh, uh, I think I'd like to think I'm a, a mentor. I mean, I'd like to think I've uh, leave some impression with actors you've worked with, and uh, and I suppose you know you become that. I mean, I'm a mentor to anybody who's interested, and and, and if they're if they're interested, then I'm interested. But uh, I don't um, I don't have any specific person no. Hmm. Okay, down here. Okay. What would what what would you tell to an aspiring actor or director to um, inspire them? I guess to encourage them. Uh, well, I would just say uh, <laughs> keep uh, keep keep after it. Keep uh, working. Uh, keep uh, keep learning new things every day, and uh, and just um, eventually, when when a great break happens, hopefully that happens to everyone. You be ready for it. Jump on it and beat it into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> what made you feel comfortable as a director, like when you started? Because there weren't that at that time. There were not a lot of actors who had made the move to directing. That was fairly. No, I, kn I, I know it. They uh, uh, when I, I I first tried to direct in in the fifties or the sixties, uh, and on Rawhide, I wanted to direct an episode of that, and mm -hmm. they promised me a, the, that I, w I would be able to do one, and then they reneged on the deal, and uh, I guess because some other series that had an actor uh, who turned director and 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 it. He'd gone way over schedule, so <laughs> uh, I. Uh, uh, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just um, I don't know. Okay, you just felt. I have no nose. <laughs> <laughs> over here. Oh, well, that's a big question. What do you think about Italian movies? Um, ah, io piace molto. See, si, siamo Italian movies. Cinema italiano. I uh, 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 very much. I, I grew up watching uh, uh, Bitter Rice with Savannah Mangano and all those kind of films that would come over. The few Italian films that would be released in the in the states, and uh, I liked uh, I liked uh, Vittorio De Sica a lot, and I got to work with him once in a, for a, a segment movie, and he was a great director. He was great fun to direct. He was sort of. Uh, a, a very charismatic character, and uh, that he was a a guy that I I I watched a lot when he was directing. Um, but I like uh, Italian movies. Uh, I I worked in I lived uh, I didn't live there, but I d f was frequently there in the in the sixties in in Rome uh, and vicino uh, vicinity, and um, it was um, it was a great period. Great period in life. I was very influenced by a, a lot of their stuff, but uh, De Sica's Bicycle Thief and, uh, and some of those were really great films to do. Okay, uh, back there. Go ahead. Okay, the qu you brought it. Just read it from back there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any, um, any shorter questions, I guess, than that. So, um, okay, right down here. Yeah. Okay. I guess the question is what, how long it took, the process took from when you got the script for Gran Torino to um, getting it into the theaters? It was oh, well, well Gran, the Gran Torino was very fast. Uh, I was doing the post-production. We were editing uh, Changeling, which we'd done earlier in the year, and uh, 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 we, we uh, started preparing Gran Torino almost immediately. And then uh, and uh, Rob Lorenz, uh, my associate, he, he, uh, he took off for Michigan and uh, put the deal together. It just came together really fast. And then we found the Hmong communities, which there's a, a, a large group in Fresno, California, and then the, and St. Paul in Minnesota, and then a smaller group in Michigan. And uh, But we ended up uh, sort of going, uh, sending the casting uh, people out into the Hmong community and found the various people that would be in the film. 
And um, it all came together very quick. And we shot the film in 32 days in, uh, in, uh, in and around Detroit. Not, not in Detroit, but around Detroit. There was a decision made to, was the script originally set in the Minneapolis area? It, it, yeah, he had it in the St. Paul, Minneapolis area. Uh, and I suppose he had it there because uh, uh, the, that was a l very large uh, enclave of uh, a very large group of uh, monks there. And, uh, but, but actually, uh, the story plot line was about a guy who worked in the Ford factory. So yeah. it, it seemed to make more sense. more sense to be in Michigan. Besides, they had a tax rebate deal that made it really attractive. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have a little bit of the W-H-O-R-E. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 I mean, we kind of went with the, uh, with the economics of it all as well. But it, it, it was actually very practical to do that uh, t rather than do it in, um, in, uh, in St. Paul or, or something like that. And, and when there was a lot of uh, the, our leading lady, the, the young lady you saw there, she was uh, from uh, uh, Michigan. So we, uh, everything worked out quite well. And we, and we brought the others over there. It was and how did you find the car, the Gran Torino itself, oh, and, the and car. what's happening to it? Well, uh, the car, we found the car uh, in uh, Utah or somewhere. <laughs> Some guy had just had one he was restored he wanted to sell, and so uh, uh, we, we bought it and, uh, and hauled it over to Michigan. <laughs> okay. From where it started, yeah. Okay. I think we have time for two more questions. Okay. Okay. The two question warning, so go ahead. Okay. Okay. What do you look for in the casting process as a director? Are there specific things that you're you're looking for? Y you know, it's some. It's just a look. It's a look and a sound. And uh, naturally, you want the person to be uh, uh, to be good and and to have a certain uh, experience uh, as an actor. Or uh, unless you're doing a film like this one, where you're willing to go with less experienced actors. But the main thing is the look, the sound, what have you. I, I remember um, Bird. You mentioned. Uh, yeah. I remember uh, uh, looking uh, at uh, Diane Venora uh, in a, a on a piece of t uh, a tape, and they had about six or eight actresses on it. And, and when I saw Diane Venora, I said, "No, we'll just stop right there." And the guy, they said, "Well, don't you want to uh, look at the rest of them?" I said, no, "On the next picture, I like this <laughs> right. girl." So it was it, it was just an inspirational thing, uh, and she did a, a wonderful test on it, and uh, and she uh, it was great in the film. Um, but uh, it's just, it, it, it changes all the time, but mostly it's a, a look, a sound, uh, how it fits in, how the cast fits in with the next, the other, the, the, the overall ensemble, how it's going to um, appear in the film. And the casting is the most important thing because if you cast a film well, uh, then the, your work is, is, is about, you're 80% there. And if you cast a film poorly, then you're never there. I mean, you may get there. You may get, a f f you may get up to fair, but you're not going to get much better. So it's a very important process, I think. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you ever? Is that a but it's no insult for a person if they don't get a role because it, m most of the time it's because they're it's just a different look that the director is looking for. Okay. You get the last question. Go ahead. Do you prefer? Um, can you talk about the differences between on-location shooting and shooting on a soundstage? Okay. And, uh, I guess the difference between working on location and, and working on soundstage, maybe sort of how much did you get on this film? This is all location, I'm assuming. Yeah, this, this film was all location. Uh, Changeling, because it was a period film, and uh, there was some interior work on sound stages, and some of it was on locations that, where that just happened to have uh, rooms that looked good for sets uh, in, in older buildings and what have you. But... Uh, uh, I prefer, I, I used to prefer, especially when my first film that I ever directed, uh, Play Missy, I did it all on location, interior, exterior, and that's exactly what we did on this film here as well. Interior and exterior was all, all on, the, on the location. But some films are different. You, uh, if you're doing a film, uh, a space uh, sp film or something, you're out in space, you have to be on sets because there's <laughs> no, <laughs> there no way you can go to location. Bring a whole crew out there. Well, maybe uh, in 20 years. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> in some other, uh, um, uh, some other time frame of history. But right now, it's uh, uh, you go out there. And, 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 and science fiction movies are uh, 
you don't have to be, you can make the location what you want it to be because you're not dealing with reality. But if you're doing with re dealing with reality, and the change thing was difficult because we had to put Los Angeles back to 1928. And at 1928, there were no buildings of any great size except a city hall. And uh, it was a very, very sprawling, uh, uh, but much smaller uh, city than it is now. And, and they had streetcars and all that stuff that they don't have now. And uh, they should have never gotten rid of, but they <laughs> did. Well, Grand Torino has gets so much of its great quality from what you pulled from the from the real locations you shot in. So you obviously gained a lot in this case. Yeah, I We're think the location uh, dictates a lot. When you get there, all of a sudden it colors the picture. It colors your you you, you uh, everything. The way you look at everything is uh, is different uh, when you when you get on location. And you can scout locations and look at them. But I think I love first impressions. Sometimes I don't like to go like location too early. Uh, it's n n and some that could be laziness, or or it could be uh, just that you'd like to get the inspiration of uh, of a new look. Okay. Well, I think we have to let you all get back to your shopping and um, shopping. You, and and <laughs> this, my wife must be out there. So we're talking <laughs> magic, the magic and, uh, word. And you have to go pick up your best actor award from the board of review. So congratulations and thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.